All right, so you know I appreciate you guys getting this far. Um, you guys are technically at unit eight, and if you walk through all the stuff you've accomplished thus far, you've learned everything from basic JavaScript all the way to working with very complex uh, serverless, highly secure, highly available uh, cloud computing. So I think you need a little bit of uh, congratulations at this point. Um, the kind of de development that people are doing these days is called responsive, and it makes and it it gives respect to the fact that people are using tablets, you know, hundreds of different form factors and tablets, you know, thousands of different of smartphones, all of whom have different web browsers, you know, thousands of different laptops with different screen resolutions and and different sizing, um, and it creates various problems because when people make formats for the web. Uh, it, it means that different people will load different versions of their website and traditionally that problem is dealt with in a thing called browser quirks where and you know CNN to you know CNN is now a very political site so I'm not going to load it but typically CNN.com would be an important website on CNN on the on the internet and it, we would use CNN as a benchmark as to how uh, websites should be made in terms of their sizing and in terms of the dimensions, Harvard, uh, Harvard's website would also have that similar status where we would go to Harvard's website to see how wide we should make a page and we'd also go to CNN to see what a standard formatted web page should be. New York Times is a similar, again, these are all very political now so I'm not going to show them, you know, uh, but in New York Times was also historically a very important website because you know, millions of people would look at it and it would mirror the kind of distribution their paper gets. Uh, now it is left-leaning, so, you know, it's, it's like really meant for half of the population. It's not meant for the paper of record. But NY Times had a very extensive uh, website distribution and it was widely trusted amongst much of the population. Um, but we would actually go to NYT to see just how wide, you know, websites should be. Nowadays, the, none of those sites matter anywhere as much as Apple's website, which is changing frequently and I think is now representative of a very cutting edge type of experience. Um, and I sense that um, the Apple website is now the benchmark for web development, which is very, very good. Now, I think right now there are two, there's maybe two or three different kinds of websites. One is the apples of the world and there's probably a handful of sites that have a team that are this good um, but the rest of the world is is using a format a framework called bootstrap right now and bootstrap is probably the most important uh, way to learn responsive web design because it was the first one of the first two frameworks that would make it so that if you use their framework, it would load automatically at the right scale size as the browser that people were using. So if people would load it on a web browser, it would automatically adjust to fit the small compressed, you know, Android or iPhone space. If you were using it on a, you know, an Alienware laptop, it would also expand to fit the size. Now I'm not talking about the size of words. I'm really talking about the, the way that the page is formatted. And so I want to get involved in, in talking about this. But just to say this, you guys have learned a great deal about the movement of data and the security of data moving over the internet. And in many ways, you have to master the security element before you can go any farther in a project. You can't secure a site after you've made it. Um, really, it's, you need to build in security at its core in order to survive the kind of uh, distributed denials that are happening in the kind of zero day and other um, exploits that are happening right now on the internet. So what we've taught you is a framework that is secure from the get-go and is head and shoulders above uh, other server-driven uh, models. But that takes time. You know, that, that is not a, a small lesson to teach. And so what we've done is we've not taught how to make the appearance of websites. Like we haven't taught the visual part of websites. We've taught you the data side of websites. And that's especially important to me because when, and here I'll bring up, you know, Craigslist again. 
it, because the textual data-driven element of the web is the part that is valued the most. And it, when we look at you know uh, sites like Twitter or Facebook, really it's just text with some decorative photography. But it's really the text that hits the human mind uh, with the most immediacy. And I, I think if you ask, you know, some research says, well, you know, what is the power of mobile devices? And many, many people say, well, what makes mobile devices so powerful is the notification. The fact that when something is happening and it notifies you, it causes people to break and to be uh, distracted from almost anything that they are doing. And by anything, I mean anything. You know, whatever they are doing, if you send somebody a text message and it rings, people will drop whatever they are doing in order to read that text message. And when I say anything, I mean anything. You know, and without quoting research, people would literally stop producing children in order to read text messages. <laughs> Does that make sense? Without getting too explicit. And my thoughts are, well, that really shows you the power of text, the power of just words and numbers, because when a notification arrives, that's all the notification can possibly contain, is just some words about, hey, look at this, you know, uh, this so-and-so did this on Twitter. So what we've done, what I've done in this course is we've emphasized the power of words and text and data as content, and now you guys have mastered it. You can upload things, you can query, you can read, write, update, delete data. That's all very good. And do so in a highly secure, you know, CIA level way. You know, and the reason why I say that is CIA runs AWS. They have their own version of AWS that Amazon gave them specially just for them. Um, but frankly, DOD, uh, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, they all use Amazon Web Services in what's called the mill cloud. And so you are operating with the same degree of integrity as the Marines when it comes to your cloud usage, which I'm proud of. I'm glad you have that. But it means that we have to attack that goal with singularity. We can't be distracted with what we're doing. And it also means that um, uh, other things have to pay. So instead of having gorgeous design, you know, and it's interesting looking at uh, uh, the Apple website, uh, today, instead of having the gorgeous design, uh, we're much more uh, committed to having security, integrity, availability, and speed. Uh, one of the things you'll notice about um, uh, static websites is that they move six times faster than other, you know, Node or Java or PHP or Ruby-driven websites. So when you're giving your customers fast access to data, you're stimulating them on a primal level that few other things, you know, it will be very hard for people to be distracted from your content. Does that make sense? And so we've put those very, very difficult values at the top of our value system. And the fact that you all have conquered them is very, very gratifying. So I'm glad you're here. Now you get to ease up a little bit and deal with that, the pretty stuff, you know, the way that things look. And so given that, let's jump into Bootstrap. Now for where you can follow at home, go to getbootstrap.com. <laughs> And as you navigate there, you can go ahead and download Bootstrap. And what that will do is it will, you can just touch download Bootstrap, and you have the choice to download Bootstrap, which I recommend, or you can download its source if you want to see how to make it, which is less a part of the assignment. Also, SAS, which is uh, uh, syntactic sugar, which is what makes uh, but it's really a very, very important part to Bootstrap. And we'll talk more about that as we go without making a mini lecture. We'll just say that this is important, but don't, don't, let, don't download this nor this. Download this, and it will show up uh, just like this. It will download. Now, I'm in a Mac. You know, some of you are not. I'm on, you know, I am, will be. Um, and so when we get into our downloads, this is what uh, Bootstrap is. Um, it's just a series of files. Uh, some of it is JavaScript, right? If you'd like to read that, right? This is the, the header files. Some of it is CSS. And some of it is uh, fonts. And sometimes these load, you're welcome to you know, load these using a font book or similar uh, font. Uh, viewer. 
Uh, no, that's not going to load for me right now. It's all right. But you can see that if you want to run Bootstrap on your website, you actually need to download all of the distribution or the dist, and then you'll begin to make new files right next door to it. Does that make sense? And so let's go into the implementation. Now the best way to learn Bootstrap is to go to the examples page. And they really mean for you to, to use the examples as a way to learn Bootstrap. They don't mean for you to be, to have to know it by heart when you first use it. They really mean for you to emulate some of their solutions and adapt, moreover, you know, to adapt their solutions to your needs. You know, so you're not copying, pasting it so much as you are kind of interpreting their work. And so let's go over to uh, some very basic uh, Bootstrap. Now the way that Bootstrap works is it breaks content up into what are called rows. And within the rows you can have columns. So columns um, can be of these widths, but you always have 12 units on the given web page. So if you have 12 units, that means that this column can be 8 units, this column can be 4 units, this column can be 4, this can be 4, and this can be 4, or maybe this column can be 6, and this, this column can be 6. Either way, there's 6, or rather 12 divisible units for every column on the page. And all you need to do is you need to break up um, these into rows in order to have new column formats. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my inspect element, as you should with every sweet page you see, and you should take a look at your content using a... So what they've done right here is they've established a row, and you can see this is a row, and within that they've set up a class called column extra small 12 units, or if it's a medium-sized screen, you load eight units, and then this is the, the word that goes in there. And then the other line is, or the other uh, column rather, is going to have six units if it's extra small, and then four if it's on a medium-sized medium device. Now this class, it seems quite convoluted, and lo let's look at the computed elements here. But what's very important about Bootstrap is it really likes divs. Bootstrap uh, can style any element of HTML, but probably the most important part of Bootstrap that you're going to focus on right now is its ability to style divs and to break your page up into big blocky elements. So no matter what your page is, you should always draw your page first in terms of blocks. And then think in terms of rows and then columns when it comes to your Bootstrap uh, code. So this div is has this particular box happening right here. So it has this padding, border, margin, and its position uh, on the page. Same with this column right here too, where it has its content and its padding and border and margin. Now, the reason why this box model is particularly interesting is because when you uh, load a Bootstrap page on a particular device, Bootstrap calculates how wide the viewport or the browser is and then it formats the page relative to the, uh, the size of the browser. So if your browser is really tight, the page will be, it won't have as many columns. If it is really wide, it will allow all those columns to generate. And so those computed attributes are happening on the fly uh, as it's downloaded. So first thing, it downloads the bootstrap, and then it downloads your content, and then as your content loads, bootstrap figures out how your page should be formatted. So it typically looks really good on a mobile device, and it also looks great in a you know in an Alienware laptop or on an iPad or similar Android. So it, that the Bootstrap idea has become the way that people design for the web, and this is the most dominant paradigm in web design right now. So now you know that, and whenever you have you know Bootstrap, you have a row, then you have different columns. But something I want to talk about here, if you can take a look, and I can't expand this, but take a look. It says div class. Now, you guys are used to having div ID equal to something. That's because JavaScript really likes to read the ID part, and then it goes get element by ID. 
Now here it's different because these don't have IDs. Instead they have classes. And the, the part that likes the classes is what's called the cascading style sheet or the CSS. So whenever you have a class, it's, it shows up here in the CSS. And so when the CSS loads, it has different attributes that it, it, it runs. And I want to show these to you. And these particular rules load every time this div loads. So you know that it has a particular padding from the top. It has 15 pixels of padding from the top. It has 15 padding of pixels from the bottom. And you can see that here when I compute them. That has the padding of 15. The border is one pixel. It has a margin of zero and its position. And let's go to the, uh, the rules and its position are unstated. And it doesn't specify a background color here. Now this width is going to be 33.333% because it has a column width of four units. So automatically the width is calculated, you know, its metrics are computed automatically when it downloads. Now it's also going to float left, which means that it's going to be locked up against uh, the left part of the page. Now it can float right and it would float up against the right part of the page, which means that whenever it appears it's always locked against one side or the other, which is good. Now all of these rules can be coded by a human being. So when you get into the, the bootstrap CSS, let me just op open this quickly. <laughs> using an editor, you can see that this is a very long file, but whenever you have a class, let's say you have the class of button default, all of these rules pertain to anything with button default class coded into it. So anytime you say class column xs6 column md4, and let's just kind of copy this and look for this here, Let's, let's do column MD4. And I'm kind of expecting that to work. A um, little confused as to why it's not working. That's all right. What we'll say instead is whenever we have this class, or you're using this class, these rules are going to apply to it. Now this is quite complex. There are quite a few rules here, right? And so whenever you utilize that class within your HTML, you can expect all of these rules to come with it, and it will format that way when it arrives in the browser. Now the reason why Bootstrap is so successful is because it's extremely easy to use. And so instead of coding uh, the divs and their respective rules along with each of these um, uh, along with each of these classes, people can just begin to use Bootstrap right from the get-go and begin to get styling and design and nice fonts right from the get-go. So let's go and say these are various columns that are available to Bootstrap. So that's important. But here, let's get to a, something that looks like a real page. So this is what a Bootstrap page looks like. It has a nice hover when you get over the button, um, great looking buttons, and then it has great looking Helvetica text. And this is what's called a jumbotron right here. This is a gigantic entry where the class of it is, you know, this is like a 32, you know, size uh, font. the Jumbotron class is particularly valuable because, you know, the padding from the top, it has 48 pixels of padding from the top. Uh, 
and it should give me this here. The padding is 48. It allows for a standard, you know, 1,000 by 20 by 265 width, and then it has a margin of 30 pixels. And that 30 pixels is that margin from the bottom. And so all of these rules come with, whenever you type in class Jumbotron, you get all these rules. Now, you don't want to have more than one Jumbotron per page. Usually Jumbotron is the way that we announce the site to the world. So we don't have many Jumbotrons. But for much of the rest of the content that you guys are going to use, you're going to have divs of type container and then divs of type row. And that's pretty important. Here's a footer that's right here at the bottom. And this is the footer class right here. So it means that uh, a person like yourself who's very focused on data, who's very focused on business process, who's very focused on security, can get very good looking pages without a lot of effort very quickly. And that's good. And that's affected just about every company. So you got the standard buttons. So that's how you kind of get started in Bootstrap. And this is a, a login where you can sign in, very similar to what you've done. And these buttons, they work the same way as the buttons that you guys have been using. So here's a cool button right there. So let's uh, so that button, class button, and the role that it takes is a button. So that's how you make a button inside of a Bootstrap. And naturally, it will follow an href if you want. But you guys can treat this button the same way that you treat your uh, HTML buttons. But these look awesome. So let's let's do a little bit more. We have grids, you have a narrow jumbotron. This is the kind of the theme where you have these cool buttons and links. And you can make tables, thumbnail images. These are labels, badges, drop down menus. These look great. You know, and you know, how do you code a drop down? No problem. Here, here's how you code a drop down. You go to your inspect element like a real pro. You say, wow, I love that drop down. How did you make that? And you go and inspect it, and you say, OK, let's grab that. That's how you make a drop down right there. You make what's called an unordered list, UL. And then for each of these buttons, you create a list item. Now, you probably remember this. This is an anchor. And this will go down to, this will load the top level page. But if you, if you label something uh, as an anchor, it will navigate to that within the same page. We can go more over that, but these these text items here are list items. Also, you have gorgeous navigational bars like this. Here's a sweet nav bar. So, for example, here's how Apple does theirs. It's scary how Apple. I don't know if they're using Bootstrap here. Um, here, let's check it out. Uh, usually, Apple does not use Bootstrap. If they were to use Bootstrap, I'd be a little bit surprised, just because, frankly. They could hire the people that made Bootstrap a hundred times over. You know, Apple has Apple is worth on any given day as much as Exxon. Do you understand? Like the app, the iPhone is worth a similar amount as oil. That's how valuable that thing is. You know, and just over the last you know eight or you know eight eight or nine years. Um, so I would expect for Apple to home bake their own framework. You know, I would expect that. But frankly, look at what they've got here. They've got something that looks exactly like what Bootstrap has been doing, you know, for the better part of a decade. So I think that you go over to Apple's and you're like, okay, that's what a quality company is doing. You know, probably one of the most valuable companies on planet Earth. This is what they are doing. And then you say, well, okay, let's try to, you know, utilize some of the features that I can do that quick, you know, within Bootstrap, et cetera. And that's perfectly okay. You know, if you were a musician, you would need to be able to play Mozart, right? If you were a great musician, they would say, okay, please play a Miles Davis standard. And just about everybody knows those things. Now, you wouldn't get the credit, you know, you wouldn't be like, oh, wow, you're great. You, you're, you know, you're Mozart. No, it's rather, no, I'm just playing Mozart. But let me say this, if you were a recording artist, you know, somebody like Billy Childs or a great jazz person, you know, most likely you would be quoting 
those wonderful artists, or you would be incorporating their work. So as long as you're not copying, you know, like, oh, here is Mozart's Fifth Symphony, you know, and then you're saying, oh, really, this is Stefan Bunn's Sixth Symphony, you know, instead, you know, you're going to, you know, instead you need to make your own stuff, but frankly, you're going to have to use code that other people have made work before, and you would need to adapt it, make it your own, you know, change it so that it fits your own needs. What I'm saying here, though, is you guys are allowed to be focused on the data, and you guys are allowed to be focused on the security at this point. And then as you go further, you think more about how to make the design work. You know, here's a progress bar. And so what you're going to do is you find something, you're like, oh, I really like that, or I like this carousel. Oh, okay, well, how do I make that? All right, well, firstly, you know, my first step is I need to load up my bootstrap. <coughs> so I grab my bootstrap right here. You know, that is if you put it on your own server, which is fine. And then you say, well, let's go take a look at this element that I love. And this is called a carousel. And you're going to assume that if you go div class carousel, that you're going to grab all the rules associated with the carousel, and that that carousel is going to gradually appear. Now, there's, there's 101 ways for you to make a mistake. So you know it's important to be detail-oriented and stick with it. Um, you know, it's part of the deal. You know, it's about work. But fairly soon, you'll be able to add an element that resembles something that you really like. So what I like about Bootstrap, and I'll get your question in just one minute, what I really like about Bootstrap is I can say to students, hey, welcome to Golden, it's like the Golden Corral of web development. Like whatever, do you guys know what Golden Corral is? You probably don't, you're college kids, so you don't know Golden Corral. You know Golden Corral. Somebody did, it, did you a solid by teaching you about Golden Corral. Like you have that crazy uncle who's like, oh, Golden Corral, whip off the highway at violent speed. Apparently there's a, a new Golden Corral, and I was speaking to my mechanic who swore that he would be the first person to walk into the Golden Corral. And I, I said, well, he said he has been the first person to walk into three different Golden Corrals across America. And so that he's so serious that he photographs himself as like the first person into Golden Corral. And what I guess I'm saying to, to you guys is that you should see Bootstrap as your sort of design golden corral where you get in there and start focusing on things that you might want. Like, I like that, or I like this, or that looks good, and I want these little things there. I forget what these are called, these little navigational elements. Or I want something that resembles this, or I want that. And I like that. I admire that. I'm going to borrow that and incorporate that for my own needs. And that's the way that we, we operate for a certain amount of time. And then as time goes on, then you, you know, gradually customize it so that it feels and looks the way that you want it to. I think for our class, if you're doing a product for us, you know, we should see that you have your own original data, such as you've been developing over two months now. And then you have you know, a little bootstrap that helps it fall into place and that gives it some tranquility. I'm sorry, you had a question? Do you mind? Yeah, no, I was yeah, just go right ahead. you. Um, Facebook used Bootstrap because it seemed like a lot of them they look very similar. You know, it's scary. I was shocked at how bootstrappy even Apple's site, you know, look at these, these, these buttons. I mean, it, it looks dramatically like, you know, like that's very similar. Yeah. But I, I think that, you know, I would, frankly, this is Apple's own proprietary font. You know, to me, this looks like an Apple font. You know, it's just a Helvetica. I mean, the way that Apple scrutinizes things, it, now, now hundreds of companies work the same way and become very user experience emphasized. Now, something to think about is the Google uh, font directory is a wonderful Google fonts. Google comes up with a new name for their products like every six months. So I may call something by Google what it was you know, 10 years ago. Um, but let's say you say, well, that's a really great font. Let's go ahead and let's select that and let's see a specimen of that. And that maybe captures the, the character of the website that interests you. And then you can do it in many many, you know, many different uh, uh, weights.
and you can pair it with other fonts. And of course, Google accompanies it with lots of statistics, like the statistic, you know, beauty metric of you know this this font. Um, and then what they've always been able to do is they've been able to teach you how to institute that font. So it's a little bit of a workspace. And this is a, a classic. And you can utilize this font. And they do such a great job. And of course, the font is listed on GitHub as an open source font. But some of this looks just wonderful. So when you look at iPhone, now frankly, the Apple people have, you know, more money than, you know, than than anyone you know, and so, you know, they probably have the ability to custom make, you know, their fonts, and so everything is very carefully, you know, chosen. For you guys, as you're new, you know, there's a lot of fonts out there, many of which are wonderful. Here's what the numbers look like. And I would recommend, you know, you kind of investigate how to make this work, how to make this uh, work. Now, here's the way that you would institute this font. You would say, let's go ahead and, and add this into the head so that it will download this. And then let's go ahead and inside of your, your CSS, you're going to add these font families. And so there's a little guide to instituting that. If that's something that you're really nuts and crazy about, then, then that's the way that you do that. And I'm sure if you come to an interview with some Google fonts, somebody's going to shake your hand vigorously. Okay, because... And then you, you literally have the ability to add, you know, weight and et cetera. Now, that's above and beyond what I expect. I, I think you all should be using Bootstrap, you know, to get things working. And for it to have a professional look and feel... And at this point, you guys, you guys and girls have earned it because you now are data security ninjas, right? You operate, you know, with, you guys operate with lots of security kung fu. So now you can begin to think about new things. And frankly, you know, I had some very excellent people visit here the other day and were saying, wow, you're, you're doing such advanced work. And my thoughts are, well, yeah, because you have you have worked on it over the course of two months. So it's logical that you have absorbed things by, by repetition, right? That karate kid repetition, that fabulous old school repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, believe me, no person is natively smart. People need to work on stuff. That's how you get good at things. So, um, so yeah, so that's my talk on uh, CSS. Now, what I've done here in my little sample and firstly, I want you guys to be able to survive out in the out in the wild. My little sample involves making a jumbotron. So most likely, you're gonna set up, you know, a little bit of Bootstrap in your S3, so you can actually take your Bootstrap distribution and just upload it to S3. That will be fine. You know, you can just upload all of that inside of these folders. Please do that up to S3. And then you're going to reference that CSS by going link href within your uh, head, the document head. And then within the body, you can set up a Jumbotron, Jumbotron div container and just do it like this. And so you can download this and begin to use it. Here's a button, you know, a large button. And then you set up a row with the col the eight unit columns and maybe a four unit column. And if, as you think of it, you know, you guys, the reason why that's really good to you, you know, why this is going to be particularly good to you is because whenever you guys do queries, and here's what your queries look like. Sorry, I'm cruising around here so quickly. I hope you're not having a seizure, but, you know, boy, since for real. Uh, you know, you guys may be creating divs, you know, within your for each statements, and that's good. But what you're going to do is you're you're going to um, append uh, elements, etc., and you're actually going to create uh, an attribute 
that is going to reflect the class that you're trying to, to work with in Bootstrap. So let me show you my example here. I'm moving fast. Um, But let me just give you a little bit more. Test link, show output. Sorry, I, I need just a moment to locate this sample. SQL databases. And it looks like I, I will need to show you a bit more. But <clears throat> one thing that I want to be very clear of is as you guys are making your divs in your output, um, you're going to add the attribute of the class. And this is probably a good demonstration right here. You're going to set the attribute or the class to whatever bootstrap class is of interest to you. So this is a wonderfully simple, but what you can do here is you're going to actually set the attribute of a div so you can reflect the class and then the name of the class. And let's just go back one. So right here, you can set the attribute of something so that you can specify the class and then say what class that is. And that works out particularly well when you're using Bootstrap because every, every div here has a named class. So you could set the class of a div based on, its, based on that name. So you'd say class container when you did this. You'd say class container. And that would automatically style your elements as they rolled off uh, the database. So we may need to create an additional um, lecture about that using set attribute. So you put in the class and then whatever the name of the class is. But that's technically how you would adapt your bootstrap to match what you're already doing with create element. You make a div and then you go dynamic div dot set element or set attribute rather class comma da da da. So that's just the way I want to finish it. I think probably what you're going to be doing for next week is you're going to be using your bootstrap a little bit to try to sample uh, with um, you know these nav bars and the buttons naturally and the general layout of the, the page. And we may have to upload a few more videos, but that's the way to get started here. So we've covered a lot. I appreciate your attention span. In absorbing all that, I think it ended up being close to an hour lecture. So um, I'll let you begin to, to work on that. And again, thank you for uh, working hard. Later. <laughs>